We're so pleased that you're joining us here tonight. The situation that has created the need for social distancing and coming together online instead of in person has also given us the topic for this year's Issues That Matter series, Pandemic Pressures Supporting Community and Family Mental Health. Nobody has escaped the pressures of the last few months. The pandemic and other major societal events have caused unprecedented stress. Health worries, financial strain, isolation, and loss of friends and loved ones have us all near the edge. Are these feelings normal or do I need help? What kind of help is available and how do I find it? Our panelists this evening will answer these questions and as many of your questions as they can. During the presentation, you can enter your questions and comments into chat at any time. They will be visible to only the panelists and Snow Isle Library staff who will collect the questions for the Q&A part of the event. All questions will be kept anonymous. If your question is for a specific panelist, please let us know. Library staff will also be sharing links to resources and library information in chat throughout the event. Tonight's program will be recorded for later viewing and will be available on the Snow Isle Library's YouTube channel in a few days. I would like to acknowledge and thank our ASL interpreters for tonight's program, Sophia Sexton and Michaela Gaspar from Purple. And finally, a big thank you to our panelists for taking the time to be here this evening. This event could not have happened without you. Please welcome Angie Jorstad, Mental Health Supervisor with Snohomish County Behavioral Health Services, Betsy Griffith, Behavioral Health Lead with Island County Human Services, and Crystal Blankenship, Manager of Behavioral Health with Providence Medical Group. Good evening. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I, I feel really honored to be a part of uh, a pretty amazing group of people. And thanks to the Snow Isle Library System for hosting this event. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk a little bit about, um, to introduce you to myself, and then share a little bit of information regarding um, family stress and most important, see family resiliency during this time, um, during this time in our lives. I think we're all still kind of navigating what this, what this feels like and, and what's normal and um, this new normal and also how best to support ourselves and support our families through this time. So I'd like to share some information with you. Um, first of all, um, my name is Angie Jorstad. I work for Snohomish County Human Services. I've, um, I'm a licensed social worker and I've been working in Snohomish County for the last uh, 25 plus years. Um, I've been fortunate to work with a number of different individuals and agencies, but currently I'm supervising work that is being done out in our communities with individuals who are homeless or incarcerated, who have behavioral health issues and helping connect them to services. Um, one of the uh, one of the programs that I supervise is our children's mental health liaison. And, and through that work, we're really focusing on um, a trauma-informed lens and doing work in schools and individually and in our agencies, recognizing that many people um, come to this come to this place because of histories of trauma or current trauma. And what we're finding is that this pandemic, this time in our lives, COVID-19, is creating uh, it's creating stress for each and every one of us in different ways. It's creating stress in our families and in our schools. And for some folks um, that, that can manifest as a trauma response. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Most of the information that I'm presenting tonight um, can be found on the Department of Health website. Um, they have a, a, quite a few resources for, for individuals and families. And, and this specific publication, I think there'll be a link to that in, the, um, in this presentation. But it is a behavioral health toolbox for families supporting children and teens during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I super encourage folks to take a look at that if they have a chance. Um, you know, what we're finding is that right now, there are so many different scenarios that families are experiencing. Um, we, have, we have families that are experiencing job stress, um, which is leading to financial, financial stress in the household. Uh, there are changes in access to basic necessities, um, access to health insurance, access to housing and food. 
Um, there's loss of social contact for all of us, for parents, for teens, uh, for young kids. And there are family members who may be ill because of the current pandemic. Um, there are teens that are missing milestone events uh, and they may be worried about their future, worried about college. Um, our family, I have two boys, I have a 16 and a six year old. So we're, you know, really noticing for with our six year old, we have changes in daycare. Uh, he's a first grader. And so his first grade experience is quite different than his kindergarten experience was. Um, we're talking about how to explain what's happening in really age, age appropriate ways. Our 16 year old is a new driver. Um, <laughs> still getting used to that, has a new car and doesn't have anywhere to go, doesn't have friends to go hang out with. And so his experience is obviously really different than our six-year-old. Uh, my spouse has a new job in the midst of this pandemic. We're both figuring out how to work from home and how to have the whole family together all day and, you know, doing our different things. I share this because um, I we have, I think, 62 participants tonight, and I'm sure there are 62 different stories about what's happening in your household and what's happening in your family. And everyone is experiencing this differently, and we're all coping differently, uh, doing the best we can. And um, it, it's really important to know that there's, you know, there's no manual for this. We're all, we're all kind of in this together and trying to figure it out together. Impacts can vary greatly. Um, depending on the community you live in, uh, depending on what type of household existed prior to this pandemic. Um, there are households that were thriving and there were households that were struggling. And this um, COVID-19 and, and its impacts um, are, compound those, those stresses that were already happening. Uh, individuals and families also were already ex experiencing stress because of different factors. Um, household instability is one, but also, you know, if you're in a household with poverty or abuse, if you are a person who experiences injustice or oppression um, based on your race or ethnicity, um, that there are so many personal and family factors that are, are already present in all of us that are impacted by, um, by a, a stressor of this scale. And so that in and of itself yields different responses and different reactions in different households. Children and youth uh, respond differently to trauma than adults. Um, kids' brains are, are, they process information differently. They lack the life experience um, really to, to process information the way adults do. Um, it's really common for kids to, to, to regress in times, in times like this. And so we'll see um, regression look really differently in different aged kids. You'll see three-year-olds um, who want to return to breastfeeding. You'll see seven-year-olds that are struggling um, with staying potty trained. You'll see cooperative teenagers pushing back a little bit. Uh, you'll see teenagers that are really independent um, all of a sudden wanting and asking for help and things. And so it's just really important to know that that's, that's a pretty normal reaction to stress and trauma. So we all, you know, we're all there. We all know that, that this is a stressful time. We're all sort of living in the midst of it. I think what, um, what I'm most hopeful to talk about tonight is this notion of resilience and this idea that resilience isn't something that you either have or you don't have. Resilience can be learned and can be taught and fostered and nurtured. And resilience is what each and every one of us need to help us move through a time of stress or trauma. And so the more that we can focus on building resilience in ourselves, and the more that we can help our, our youth in our community and in our households develop resilient factors, um, the more likely we're gonna come through this uh, together and successfully and sometimes um, even stronger and having learned skills that we didn't even know that, that we had. Resilience is the ability to recover from a bad event or other challenges. Um, it can be taught to people in all age groups. And typically you can build resilience by learning ways to adapt, um, by developing, practicing, learning flexibility, um, developing and nurturing strong connection and relationships with others, which we've all found I think is difficult and we're learning new ways to do that like tonight. 
Um, finding and feeling a sense of purpose. So really spending some time thinking about whether that's, you know, the purpose of your day, uh, or sometimes for me, the purpose of my hour, <laughs> um, but also focusing on hope and, and future planning and, and thinking about what things look like in the future. Children and teens especially need to develop and recover their trust in others, uh, develop a sense of safety and stability, and regain a sense of control. And those are all things as, as adults in their lives that we can help, that we can help with. So the tangible things that we can do, and we'll talk more about this too in, in, in a future discussion, um, but there's, it's, it's not, luckily it's not rocket science. There's some really um, things that we can sort of commit to to help build this resiliency. Establishing a predictable routine, uh, deciding that, you know, we're gonna get up at the same time every day, uh, we're going to take a shower and get dressed every day. We're going to have meal times at the same time. Bedtime is going to be at the same time. That routine is great for kids. It's also really important for adults to have that, that ability to predict what our day is going to look like. Um, having family roundtables, talking about different things as a family, establishing that connection in your household, um, letting your kids decide on the topic. Maybe not having a topic have anything to do with COVID-19 or current events, but maybe it's their favorite Minecraft character or um, when the pandemic is over, what the first thing is they're going to do that they're looking forward to. Um, helping each other share feelings, helping each other connect, uh, creating quiet spaces where you can go and, and just be. Um, there, there are things that we can continue to do and we'll talk more in our household about building those, building resiliency. The other thing we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight is self-care. And you hear about self-care, you know, often. It's really easy to say, it can be really difficult to do and really difficult to commit to and difficult to determine that that's a priority. But honestly, we're better parents, we're better partners, we're better community members when we're taking care of ourselves. And so we'll talk a little bit about, about ways to incorporate that into your, into your routine, into your day. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. And now that we've had just a little kind of an overview of, of what we're going to be talking tonight about tonight, and what we'd love for you to ask questions about as we continue talking, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Betsy, and she's going to share a little bit more information. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I am so glad to join you tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, a little bit about me and, and my role. Um, I work with Island County Human Services in a few different roles. Um, I had started as a school-based behavioral health counselor and most of my career has been spent working with adolescents. Um, I am now overseeing um, our families program as well as the opioid outreach program, which kind of brings in two important pieces of, of what we're talking about today. Um, and a big part of what we've been doing over the past year has, well, I guess it's 10 months, um, has been responding to how is our community um, struggling and, and what needs are there and what resources are popping up and how do we get these resources out as quickly as possible. Um, so a piece of this is community outreach. How do we support, um, you know, the local grocery store and the essential employees who are working there? How do we support, you know, just a number of um, people who are really struggling on the front lines right now and, and getting some supports to them? Um, also on a broader spectrum, trying to push some social media. So all of these things that we're going to talk about tonight, more often than not, we're putting little blurbs um, a couple times a week on, on Facebook to remind people to do some of these things. Um, we're co collaborating with schools to, one, get some of the CARES funding um, connected so they have more resources to work with, um, but also how can our programs help to support them in, in overlapping that way, both for students and families and also with um, staff, because, you know, again, when we talk about the people on the front lines right now, I can't imagine a worse year to be a teacher, just the level of stress that they're carrying too, um, while they're supporting our, our youth. Um, and, and also, you know, looking at basic needs and, and this year, especially with um, unemployment and um, people shifting places where they're staying and, and just a number of factors has been really a hardship. So um, helping to scatter these resources to, to people who are most um, in need of them and, and getting the supports going. So, you know, all of these things are really 
I think my concern here is, is looking at um, those basic needs and how are we getting those building blocks in place um, to help support higher levels of, of psychological care and, and getting those needs met for our families and our youth and um, our community as a whole, because we're only going to do as well as um, our whole is doing. Um, also looking at kind of that overlap, and I, I, I really feel Lucky is the right word, um, but getting to work with the opioid program as well as the youth programs um, of really kind of keeping a, a finger on the pulse of what's going on with substance use in our communities. And, and I think one of the big things that we're seeing is um, people are struggling and is coming out in ways that aren't necessarily um, adaptive. So we're seeing rises in um, alcohol sales, rises in marijuana sales. Um, and that's really a good indicator that people are really struggling in, in ways that um, need some support in, in reaching out to do that. So, you know, making sure that we're connecting to those and, and getting that information out. Um, and, 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 you know, I want to kind of reflect on what Angie just said about self-care. Um, when I think about self-care, you know, I think sometimes it gets this kind of high gluten idea of, you know, this section of the bookstore. Um, but really, it's, it's not that thing. It's not take a bubble bath and, you know, whisk your worries away. It, to me, I'm going to think of like dental care for those of you who are fans of your teeth. We brush our teeth every day. We self-care our teeth every day. No one would look twice at you for saying that's an important part of your routine. Um, and if anything, they might judge you if you didn't. <laughs> and then we have professional care as well. We have going to see um, a dentist and, and maybe an orthodontist and you know all these other things that we can do to um, make sure that our teeth will last a lifetime. Well, I think that deserves the same thing for our psychological well-being. There are so many things and everyone's thing is different. We're not gonna say there's a one size fits all today, um, but having a menu of items that can help you and your loved ones um, to build that strong foundation. And then, you know, we have that second layer of um, connecting to um, more care when you need it. And that might be a number of things. And I think we'll talk more about this, but I'm just going to touch brief, briefly on this. Um, items like support groups can be really great. Um, items like your family doctor are, are great as well. That can be, and for yourself and for your children. Um, I will say our pediatrician in Thailand is a great gatekeeper for mental health and, and is often a first stop that young people are, are getting that connection. Um, so having those resources at ongoing therapy and that it's never been a better time to get counseling than right now. Well, I will say specifically in Island County because um, we're so isolated and it's hard to find that exact specialty that you're looking for. And, um, you know, at times that could mean driving an hour or two hours away to get a specialty that, that you're looking to, to support the needs that you have. Um, and now more and more counselors and mental health professionals are being pushed online. Um, maybe they wouldn't have before, but now they are. And um, that's just making things so much more convenient for our isolated rural populations, which is wonderful. So that makes me very happy. Um, I would talk a little bit about um, when we look at resilience, you know, resilience isn't something that we um, have, we're not born with it. It's not that magic wand that was touched on us when we were, you know, kids. Um, or just luck of the draw. It's the things that we do. And when we look at people who are resilient, they're resilient often because they, they do things on a regular basis that help that. They have good social connections. Um, they take good care of their physical well-being. They are creative. They have outlets for things. Um, there's, some, there's a really great um, kind of checklist <laughs> I went through a, a resiliency training that you can look at this and say, what am I going to do to build resiliency today? You know, am I going to learn how to play a song on guitar or am I going to paint a picture? And none of these things are based on how good these things are or how talented you are in that field, but just the doing of it can be really fantastic. So um, those those are the, the active pieces of the things that we do. Um, and I have a, a little um, piece too that when we're talking about building these things, that, that, that activity of doing things and, and how we can incorporate that into our lives, um, a list of things to make it easier. So I think, you know, one of the areas that I'm really passionate about um, is getting into the mindfulness and, and building um, practices like yoga, not um, the stuff you're seeing on Instagram where you know you have to bend in a million directions, the breathing part of it. The hardest pose in yoga um, <laughs> is svasana, laying down, breathing, sitting quietly and being able to maintain that without thinking I have to rush off and do this thing or finish this project or worry about this thing. That's the hardest part. Um, and more than anything, that's the thing that we need right now. So. I've included a list of um, things which the presenters can share today. But 
free or very cheap apps. There's lots of technology out there to help us to connect to these things, both for ourselves, who are the gatekeepers of well-being for our children. Um, and then also there's a number of, of things that help to support there. Um, one of the tech pieces that I would like to share, and we can talk more about this as we keep going. I'm just gonna hold this up. Um, on my sheet, one of my favorites that I have used with youth for a long time is an app called Smiling Mind. Um, and my, my pitch on meditation and mindfulness for, for youth and adults um, is that it can feel really overwhelming to say, you know, you just need to sit down and breathe and take some time to, to find some mindfulness and calm down. Um, and when we offer that to people, it can, it can feel overwhelming. Like, I can't. Like, how would I even start? Um, and the answer is find something that guides you. A guided mindfulness can be really um, impactful, and there's great outcomes on reduction in anxiety, reduction in depression, um, overall well-being, even seeing physical changes can be um, accomplished in this, this avenue. So when I say that, again, free app, um, the only pieces they charge for is like workplace mindfulness, which we don't have to worry about that right now. Um, but they also have some great little resources like the Smiling Minds Family Program. And it gives you these little activities that you can do with your kids. Um, so things like collecting um, things of different texture while you're outside. And you get to draw this in a little glass jar in your practice book. So free um, and the internet is full of resources like this. So again, we have a list of these that we can kind of talk through as we go. Um, but just taking some time and making that part of our routine. So when we wake up in the morning, we do this thing, or when we're getting ready for bedtime, we can do this thing that helps to, um, again, coming back to those resiliences, put those resiliences into practice and build this, this core of well-being um, to help take care of our, our mental health and well-being. And I will pass to Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you for sharing all of that wisdom there. So my name is Crystal Blinkenship. I'm a, I'm a clinical social worker by trade, um, currently manager of behavioral health at Providence Medical Group, um, which includes our integrated therapy. Um, so folks, you know, if, if you have a provider, um, medical provider at Providence, you could talk to them about possibly seeing um, one of the therapists in the clinic, which is wonderful, right? We're really working to destigmatize mental health and really recognize that it's it is health it's actually just taking care of yourself um, as I also manage the um, behavioral health urgent care which is um, you know on some levels I feel is like a no die like yes we should have that everywhere and we really that is our goal is is our desires to have um, behavioral health urgent cares in every community. We have walk-in clinics for spraining your ankle, right? And <laughs> many corners. So this is kind of the same thing. So, you know, you don't necessarily want to go to the emergency room. You're not at that level, but you still, you need to, you're in urgent need of, of some help. And so this is a nice way to get that um, without having to go to an emergency room, which can feel just too overwhelming and, and actually might change your mind about getting help. So um, that's been actually a wonderful, we're a year in um, as far as that service goes. And um, I think what I've, what I've really seen since COVID hit, right, is, is a real increase in anxiety. And honestly, it makes a lot of sense. So um, when we look at what's actually happening, right, this pandemic happened and it's happening to everybody. Like there's no, it, it does not judge. <laughs> it's happening to everywhere and not just in our country, but it's, it's global. So this is really unprecedented in a way. Um, and on top of that, right, it's a real threat. I mean, there's a real physical threat happening. So this is not, you know, in our head, it's real. And as we're exposed to that, it's chronic, right? It's never ending. We're seeing it. It's affecting us in, you know, not just hearing about it. Like it's, we can't go to school, right? All of the things that we did before are gone. And it really just kind of lifted a sense, kind of like a lid off of maybe the things that were keeping us grounded no more, right? Those, those outlets that we had are gone. And so we are all experiencing a chronic trauma, and so if you're feeling it, if you're noticing it in your body and 
your, your mind, man, I, I wouldn't have identified as an anxious person. And now I just feel like this feeling, what is that? I'm not familiar with it. Um, you're having a normal human response to these external factors that we don't have any control over really. There's, there's a little bit that we can do, but not a lot. And so really when we look at what's happening to us just on a physiological level. So I think it's really helpful to just understand that, okay, I'm normal. <laughs> I'm having a normal response. My body's doing its job. My body is saying, okay, this is something scary. There's, there's a perceived danger. There's a perceived threat happening to me. I need to utilize what I know. And what do I know? I have fight or flight. I have faint or freeze, right? So we have this great system within us that really does its job. <laughs> the hard part is that it cannot actually see, am I actually in danger right now? If I'm at home, right? I'm, I'm, doing what I need to do. I'm okay right now. Those thoughts are still going. What if, what if that, you know, I'm worried about my, my grandfather, you know, I'm all of these things are going through my mind. My body's responding and maybe my heart rate's going up. I'm having a hard time concentrating. I'm really feeling pretty disconnected. I am just having a hard time focusing. Um, it makes it hard for me to sleep. I just can't settle down what that's telling me is my body is, is responding. It's, it, there's, there's a perceived threat, danger, my life's in danger. So I have to kind of coach myself a little bit. I have to do some self-talk. I have to kind of take this brain that does so many things for me automatically. I need to kind of put it back into manual versus automatic. And I need to say, hey, actually, let me take a pause for a minute. And am I actually in danger or am I okay right now? Right? When we get into what we call this hyper state of arousal, which is that fight or flight, um, it can take a good 20 minutes or so to get back down. So give yourself grace. When you start to feel yourself escalate in that space, right? We can panic. When you do recognize it, give yourself grace that you're not gonna just turn it off, right? It's gonna take some time. So when we talk about mindfulness or breathing, breathing is a great technique when we're at that state to just, right? Because when you're at that hyper state, your breathing may be a little more shallow. So you're forcing yourself to take that deep breath and you have a physiological response to that. And it helps you kind of relax. So then you can reset and go, okay, where am I? So the other piece of our nervous system, like I said, that fight or flight, faint or freeze. So faint or freeze is really kind of, you know, you just get overwhelmed, it's too much, and then shut down, okay? Well, shutting down, you know, getting really small, freezing, plain dead, it's a great way to survive as well. That can continue on though, and that's where we find that depression. So it's, it's really, again, a normal human response. And so when we're down in that, we call that hypo, so low hypo state of arousal, Again, we have a hard time feeling connected to others. It's hard to really concentrate. It's shutting down. You actually, your heart rate lowers. It's, it's about just getting some space. You may dissociate a little bit. Um, so when I notice that, then again, I got to check in. Am I in danger? Why, why is my body telling me I need to shut down? What has been so overwhelming and feeling threatening that I'm feeling this way? Am I actually in danger? Okay, if I'm not, then how do I get myself going? So, so where we're at that hyper state with that anxiety, we want to bring things down. We got to do the opposite. We got to stomp your feet, right? You have to force yourself. So um, what we call that when we're in that, that depressive state is that we want to activate ourselves. So we have to kind of, kind of fake it till you make it in a way. You got to just kind of push, you know, stomp those feet, get up, right? Make myself take a shower been three days I probably just need to make myself go do that I don't really want to I have no desire to but let's just go ahead and do it and you know what you get going you get moving you get that energy moving and usually you feel better usually you typically are like oh, I'm glad I did that I made it happen I'm not going to have a desire to do it but I have to kind of make myself do it so what I hope you take away from that that was like a real like throwing it out the wall at you <laughs> is that when you're feeling those those physical sensations that that 
when you're feeling that anxiety, when you're feeling that depression, you're a normal human being. There's nothing wrong with you. You're having a normal human response to all of these external factors that are coming into play and you're doing your best to manage. And you're gonna have more awareness now when you notice that. Okay, am I up here? What are some things I can do to kind of regulate myself back down? Am I down here? What are some things I can do to regulate myself back up? And then I wanna be more in that mid range where then I can connect with others. I can, you know, feel all those feelings. So I just like to always point that out because sometimes when we're experiencing these different emotions and feelings, especially if maybe we're not used to it, um, it's very isolating, right? It doesn't feel comfortable. How do I say this? This is what I'm experiencing. I don't even really know what I'm experiencing. This is, this is you know, overwhelming. Um, it is normal. And, and these are some things that you, and you can actually do some things about that. Those thoughts are really powerful. So every thought that comes in your head is not necessarily true. So you can challenge that a little bit. Those feelings are real. So, tr so your feelings are valid hundred percent, but the thoughts that may be driving those feelings, we can challenge them a little bit. So again, am I in danger? Okay. I'm not right now. Right now I'm okay. So it's okay to be okay right now. And so allowing yourself to kind of take, take some control back because a, so much of this is out of our control, so much. Um, I wanted to also just kind of say, point out, I, I saw that, I don't know where I saw this from, but um, you know, the difference between 2020 and, and 2021, what is it? Um, I think really the difference is that we are coming into 2021 with an awareness. <laughs> we're not going to get <laughs> the rug ripped out from under us this time around. We have, we have incredible resiliency. We, we have made it through an intense year of things happening that we would have never thought would have happened this time last year. If you would have told me, buckle up, you're going to be ready for a global pandemic. You're going to, you're not going to have, you, nothing is going to look the same. I would have been like, yeah, right. No, that's not going to happen. It did, and we made it, and, and we were continuing to figure it out. And I think that's what's been really inspiring um, over the course of this year is, you know, I, I work with therapists who, you know, are working with their clients and, and they're saying, I am on the same path as my patient. I, what do I do? And, and just seeing, you know, everyone, I mean, this has kind of been a leveling the field has been leveled in many ways and just seeing how we've we've all been coming together and finding ways to help each other to really reach that hand out and and reach a hand up because that's hard too that's hard to ask for help um, I know one of the things we want to um, talk about or you know just provide information on is kind of what when do I know if what I'm feeling is just don't worry about it just get through it I'm okay and when I need to be concerned when I need to maybe raise that white flag essentially and say, hey, I need some help. Um, what I would say is, you know, just really pay attention to your body. Just know that what you're experiencing again is normal. But if you're finding that, man, I am, you know, maybe I'm down in that low spot. I'm really, it has been maybe a week since I've taken a shower. I really am not that hungry. I, I just don't really, the things that I used to enjoy, the things that used to inspire me, they're just not there. That would be a red flag for me. That would be an opportunity to say, maybe I need, I need to reach out to someone I trust and, and just kind of let them in. Um, maybe I need to go ahead and, and call the crisis line. Honestly, the crisis line can be a great option. Um, maybe I need to come in and see my doctor or I'm not connected to any doctor. You know, I'm not really sure what to do come into the urgent care, the, the behavioral health urgent care and, and just say, hey, you know what? I don't really know what I need, but this is not normal for me and I'm struggling. Um, you're, you're not alone. Um, this can be incredibly isolating, um, but you're not alone. And um, it's so, you know, I just, I can't stress enough um, how it can be a slippery slope of, of, you know, denying ourselves help until um, it gets to a point where we really um, 
are in desperate need. And so when you start to feel that, you know, just know this is normal. This is about being human. And um, there are so many people who care and so many people with knowledge. And even if we don't, we don't all know it all either. <laughs> we want to help each other. And um, I think that's, that's a big, big piece that I want to um, get across tonight. So, all right. Such good information. Thanks, Crystal and Betsy, just for taking the time to share your knowledge and your passion. I don't know about everybody else out there, but I have a ton of questions for both of you. So <laughs> I'm not going to take up that time tonight, but I probably will react, reach out to you later. Um, a couple things that uh, that what you said um, brought up for me. I was I was thinking, Betsy, about. Uh, meditation and and the importance of breathing and it's interesting in this Department of Health um, pamphlet that where they talk about resilience and and self care and one of the things they talk about is um, for young kids that can be that can be really hard to sort of um, for them to conceptualize mm -hmm. what that all means and as, as parents how best to sort of lead them in that direction. And, and it gives a couple of really great exercises for younger kids that, um, that really are meditative, but, um, but fun as well. So the, when you were talking about breathing, one of the exercises is um, bubble blowing. And it talks about, you know, to get, get um, the, the bubbles with the, the longer wand and then kind of the bigger wand and then to practice or to have a contest blowing the biggest bubble. And in order to blow a big bubble, you have to take a deep breath in and you have to blow softly, slowly. So yes, you're blowing big bubbles, but you're also meditatively breathing and you're also taking time to fill your body with oxygen. And um, so I just think that's, it's, it doesn't have to be pres prescriptive. Meditation can be, it can be fun and it can be playful and it can look different. Um, but also help help meet those needs, especially with some of our some of our young kids. Um, and then Crystal, you were talking about this notion of of um, sort of you're you're getting stuck in in one sort of thought and and deciding you're just gonna you're gonna change that thought. And that's actually a form of self care when you change your thoughts. You have the power to change your feelings and and that's a way to care for yourself to decide you know maybe you're feeling your maybe your thought is i'm totally overwhelmed i don't know how i'm going to get through this day and and to make a conscious decision to change that to wow things are really hard right now i'm going to pick one thing that i'm going to accomplish today Maybe it's a shower, maybe it's brushing my teeth, my dental self-care. Um, I'm gonna put one foot in front of the other today. And that those, those changing thoughts is easier than changing feelings, but changing thoughts leads to your feelings changing. And that's a way we can care for ourselves to make a decision when we're in that space. I'm gonna work really hard to change my thought today. So thank you both. Those are um, just, just really great, you know, just some great information. Um, you know, as you both were talking, I was jotting down some notes and and thinking about the the folks that are here tonight and and joining in and taking time out of their life to to spend time with us. Thank you all. Um, you know, we're living in this in this age right now where we do have so much information at our fingertips, right? We have these interwebs that we can type in a few words in the, in the Google bar and come up with hundreds of thousands of search results. Um, so I think for a lot of folks, that, that amount of knowledge can be just as overwhelming as not knowing where to turn or not having any knowledge. I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, if someone's out there and maybe they know they're in kind of a rough space, or maybe they see their their spouse or their friend or their kids in a rough space, where's a, where do you think is a good place to start? Like, what do you think might be, um, I don't know, sort of that first step or that, that first kind of thing to do when you're kind of overwhelmed and you don't know what that first thing to do is. I'm wondering if Betsy or Crystal, if either of you have any thoughts about, about that. You want to grab it, Betsy? 
Sure. Um, I think someone kind of touched on this earlier, but um, crisis lines, you know, I think we have put a kind of stigma on them. You know, a lot of times it's suicide hotline or, or something like that. One, there are a range of different um, crisis lines that you can call for different purposes. Um, and the threshold is lower than I think sometimes we make it seem. So that would be my first stop. If you don't feel comfortable talking to the person in your family or if you don't feel like you have other places that you can reach out to, I would say crisis lines are amazing. Um, and just kind of getting that feel. And there's different ways to do it too. You can text, you can call in, you can, there's websites where you can get on your computer. Um, so I think that would be a, a really nice first option. And then I think the second piece that I, I really like, you don't have to go this route, but um, I think if you have a good relationship with your medical provider, that's another really good next stop because they know you well and they're gonna hopefully recognize changes that this is something that's out of character and, and can make some recommendations and should have some connections in the community. Yeah, I would, I would 100% agree with that. Um, and sometimes I hear folks say, gosh, you know, uh, in terms of calling a crisis line hotline, um, somebody else is going to need it more than me. You know, someone else is, is more in crisis than I am. I don't want to take up, tie up the lines. I don't want to do that. Um, no, <laughs> I mean, the, the reality is if you're at that place, you're exactly, you're exactly doing the right thing by making that phone call. Um, yeah, it's not, um, what I tell folks too is it's really, um, this is the opportunity if, if you're feeling pulled to it, like listen to that gut, that gut instinct um, and make that call. And um, that's, that's that kind of that first step if you're not comfortable. Um, if you do have, you know, if you're fortunate to have um, good connections with, with people, you know, maybe there's that one person that you can kind of just feel like you can be vulnerable with, you know, that can always be a great way to start. And I also agree with if, you know, if you are also able to have a um, conversation with a primary care, with a doctor or nurse, um, just to, kind of laid out there and again they can really validate you know that there's a lot of different factors going on and and here's some here's some routes to take um there are there's there's a lot out there um in terms of different kinds of hotlines and and you know people to reach out to so that's a good place to start um and i guess i would just say um trust yourself i think we have a hard time trusting ourselves but if you're feeling that urge then then go with it Great. I think um, speaking of resources, in case folks aren't aware, there are um, quite a few resources showing up in the chat. So please take a look at those and, and uh, copy down or click on some of those links. Um, I want to reiterate that the, the crisis lines that are available in our counties are not just for the person in crisis. So if you see someone in your household or in your circle and um, you see someone, you know, that you know that's kind of putting out there that they're not doing okay, you can call the care crisis line and, and ask for support or resources or ideas about, you know, what, what you could do to support that person. I really also want to encourage folks, you know, if they're, if they're comfortable and maybe it's that call to the care crisis line first that helps them get comfortable um, to, to ask the question. You know, I think that in, in our society, sometimes we shy away from, from acknowledging when people aren't okay or people don't seem to be okay. And sometimes that's that could be kind of the gateway that people need to, to be able to be vulnerable and open and share that they're struggling and share that they're not okay. And I, I also think sometimes that we feel like if we're gonna ask the question, if someone's okay, then we better have the answers. We better know how to fix it, right? And that's, people don't necessarily wanna be fixed. They wanna know that someone notices. They want to know that someone cares enough to ask the question, um, to check in. And, and if the person that you ask isn't okay, and you're not sure what to do next, there are resources out there and, and you guys can figure it out together. And sometimes just asking the question and just being present with that person um, is the first step, is, the, is what they need to start moving in a different direction. So um, so don't be afraid to ask the question and 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 get information to help you feel okay about asking the question. I'm curious um, to talk a little bit about, you know, I, Betsy and Crystal and I have all worked 
in our respective fields and communities for for a few years now. Um, I, I'm curious to hear what Betsy and Crystal, you've noticed in your line of work or in your communities, um, what's different now um, since March or April um, that maybe wasn't present prior to the pandemic? What are we seeing in our communities that maybe we didn't see before? Or what are we seeing more of? Um, and what kinds of resources maybe are we utilizing or pointing people to uh, more because of that? So I think for, I mean, really everywhere, but here too, um, we're just seeing this um, kind of chasm of our supports. Um, so whether we're talking parents and all the supports they had, whether it was grandparents to help care for children or schools that had a place to go or childcare, or, um, or even just the things that you do with your children. Um, and then I, again, you know, kind of having a foot in both realms, um, looking at, um, the work that we do in opioid outreach, um, a lot of the most marginalized people in our communities have lost their basic supports. So for instance, libraries aren't open right now and a lot of people who don't have safe places to be during the day might spend time in libraries that's warm and it's dry um, or on our public transportation um, or in our soup kitchen in Oak Harbor. Um, and, and all of these things have been shifted into different um, forms of operation. So there's still food getting out to some populations, but um, they don't have a safe place to be. So kind of making up those gaps is, is important. Um, and then I also think the way we've always done things has changed that, you know, when we're talking about, okay, you can go see a counselor and maybe somebody went to see one a year ago or five years ago. And, you know, that routine that they did to make that happen is a little bit different now. And a lot more is um, internet-based and Zoom-based and whether they don't feel comfortable or whether they don't know how to navigate or whether they don't have the technology to make those things happen. Um, I think that's that's a hardship too. And, and circling back to you know youth and um, a lot of the traditional ways that youth connected with each other and, and found some um, support. And you know we talked about that resilience piece and being involved in sports and being involved in um, autonomous activities without, without family, um, that's not really available right now either. So when we look at all of these things that we're talking about, we have to get real creative really fast to figure out how to supplement those things in our communities. Yeah, I would, I would definitely echo that and add, um, as far as just presentations, you know, I think that anxiety has really increased overall um, as far as what people are experiencing. Um, and those normal coping tools are just ripped away in a lot of, and for a lot of us. And so um, we've had to become creative and find new ways to replace that. And, you know, as we're, as we're dealing with this really common chronic trauma, essentially, that we're experiencing, um, we're all doing it the best way we know how. And so some of that sometimes looks like su increased substance use. And so we're definitely seeing more of that. Um, but, but when I see it, you know, and I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it in, in folks that are saying, hey, I, I need to get help. And so it's really a beautiful thing in that sense that, um, that we are recognizing in ourselves when when we need to um, reach out when man this is getting out of balance and and I need to get help and so um, so I just really you know appreciate that we've been able to be flexible. We've been able to respond to the need in terms of providing things virtually like this tonight, you know, I think, you know, we've said it before, but you know, this just, we're able to just capture so many more people, you know, there's more opportunity in that sense. So it's been a change. Um, the, the negative has forced some positives, I guess, is what I want to say. Um, and it again, just really highlights how incredibly resilient we are as, as human beings. And um, the, the resources have changed and they, um, you know, there was it was almost kind of like a tide, you know, when the tide goes out. So it was, you know, we lost a lot in the beginning and now it's coming back, you know, and I, I think that's also highlighted um, just the fact that we're here and we're talking about all of this. I don't know that we necessarily have these discussions as often a year ago um, as we're starting to have now. And so that's, that's wonderful. That's 
great because it's so important, you know, to talk about um, and normalize just how we're experiencing these and what do we do about it. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> Crystal, I'm so glad you brought that up. I was in a conversation a few days ago and, and we started talking about COVID silver linings and the, the things that are coming out of our current, um, our current state that, that I think will, um, that will end up Im improving our lives and our communities moving forward. I think that one, and one of the things that came up is this notion that um, it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to tell someone that you're not okay. And I think that, I think this has really opened that door for so many people, you know, like you mentioned in, in your introduction, this is a global issue. So, so we know it's not just us in the boat, right? There are so many people, um, maybe in different boats, but it, there's a lot of boats out there and, and people that are struggling in different ways. And it, it's just really made it more okay than ever um, for people to, to be really kind of honest about the fact that they're struggling and especially, um, in the helping professions. I think that therapists and social service staff and people that are there to help other people, um, maybe struggle the most with being able to say, Hey, I'm not okay. Cause that's their job is to help other people be okay. So they should be able to figure out how to make themselves. Okay. Right. Um, so in the helping professions too, I think that we've had a lot of conversations, at least in, in the circles um, where I am about how do, again, kind of back to self-care, how do we make sure that we're creating space um, for ourselves and, and for the people that we're working with to be really honest about um, what's not working? And then how do we um, sort of find the resources to help with that. But then how do we carry that forward? You know, five years from now, 10 years from now, um, hopefully we will be moved through this and, and we'll be in a new place, but how do we still cultivate the space and a culture where it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to talk about it. Um, so thank you both for, for kind of talking through, you know, um, for you, what you're what you're noticing and what you're seeing. I think it's it's important to to just sort of highlight that and name that and then think about where that where that takes us. Um, I'm I'm wondering, I think one more question for the three of us just to to talk through and then I'm really uh, I really want to make sure we have plenty of time for for questions um, from the group and and opportunities to answer those questions but curious um either crystal or betsy if you have thoughts about where we're going what things are going to look like um, in three months or six months or 12 months and what if anything you're doing now to sort of um to sort of be present for that i know i can kind of start i know that we've talked a lot about um, the, the number of folks who are teleworking and the number of kids who are remote learning. And so, you know, a lot of our, a lot of folks in our community have spent the last six or eight months um, in their homes and, and kind of figuring that out and transitioning back to a classroom setting, um, transitioning back to a cubicle in an office building, transitioning back to a classroom for teachers. Um, that, you know, while, while we all, I think, talk about like, oh, I can't wait to get back to normal, that transition in and of itself, I think, is um, bound to be a, a different kind of stressful. Right, something else that we need to figure out how to adjust to, and so we've really started talking um, on my team about, you know, what do you, what do we need, what do, what will we need to help that transition um, feel okay? What do we think that will that will feel like? Um, what kinds of things could we do now to help prepare ourselves and our and our kids um, and our families for those transitions? So. We're sort of trying to anticipate, you know, whether it's in three or six or nine months when those transitions happen for all of us, how best can we support each other um, through what what we think might be something we're all excited about, but is bound to increase stress as well. Um, so that's just one example. I'm curious if either of you have thoughts about what we're looking at moving forward and, and how you're helping to prepare for that. Um, that's a really great question, and I think that 
it's a good thing to point out, right? We get kind of ahead of ourselves, like, oh my gosh, I can't wait till this be over. And and yet, you know, we've been doing this now for a while. So on some level, we are now, we have grown accustomed to this, you know, the new normal. <laughs> and change is not an easy thing for us to do. So just that, you know, when, when I think about, you know, preparing for change, just the discussion, you know, just continuing to have that discussion around what is this going to look like and, and preparing for when that's going to happen. Um, I know, so for myself, I had, you know, all of our therapists went home and working from home and then, okay, let's bring them back. And that was really tough. It was actually really, really tough because, you know, there's still a lot of that, the reason for going home, right? That threat is still around. So even three months from now, I mean, let's be honest, the COVID's not going away. So, you know, there, there's going to still be that piece of it that we're never going to forget. Um, and so how do we reconcile with that? Um, and part of it is just continuing to have the conversation of, okay, what is it going to look like when I get back into the classroom? You know, I've been used to kind of, you know, being able to just roll out of bed, touch my computer, <laughs> you know, it's going to be, it's going to be another adjustment. Um, but what I would also say is, you know, reflect back. Look, I've made this huge adjustment already. I'm capable. I am capable of change. I'm capable of adjusting to major life changes and, and I've survived and I made it through. And it was not easy. It wasn't, I'm, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but I can do it again and, and I'll be okay. And I won't be alone. I know I'm not the only one. Um, sometimes it's just helpful to do that reflection of what have I already accomplished? What have I already done before? Um, that's going to be similar to what I need to prepare myself for the future. Um, that's how I'm dealing with it. <laughs> I, I think part of my hope in this transition too is one, it's we're in a very and in a fortunate moment right now that we have something to look forward to. And, you know, all of this that's been culminating, there's hope is burgeoning right now. Um, but also the idea that for hopefully some of us, there were some um, silver linings that we had. We had extra time with our kids. We had simpler times <laughs> with our families. Um, we found creative ways to really connect to people in a, in a meaningful way. Um, versus, you know, maybe we didn't do that as much before. Maybe we were just kind of getting things done. And, and my hope is that as we move forward, as we're able to, and, and again, some people are more privileged than others and can't, um, but incorporating that in ways that we can. And, you know, maybe more workplaces when able to allow a little, a little extra work from home, a half a day here and there um, for some of the paperwork stuff or, you know, being able to, to sit while you're, you know, your young person is, um, running around the yard and, you know, finishing up the paperwork at home and having that extra kind of connectedness. Um, so my hope is that, you know, we do carry some, some good things out of a very rough time. Those are great, great ideas. Thanks for, thanks for sharing your perspective. I want to check in with Anne and see if there are any questions from the group. There are. We are getting some great questions from people. And I'm seeing a couple of different themes here. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is share a couple of questions that are kind of related um, around one topic. And you can talk about that. And then we can move on to the next one. So um, the first one have to do kind of with students and teens. And we have one as a retired educator, I certainly realize how learning from home is impacting our kids. How can a grandma help kids in her neighborhood? This topic is so critical. And then related to that, we have, do you have any specific resources for parents of teens? Recognizing and dealing with their stressors, seeing the difference between normal adolescent ups and downs, what is normal and what is not normal. Yeah, I have a few things that that kind of come to mind, so I'm happy to jump in first. 
Um, I think that with, with resources, for resources for teens, um, one of the, I think, underutilized uh, areas to go to is uh, school guidance counselors, school behavioral health counselors, um, school staff that that work with that are used to working with kids in person and used to, you know, hearing teachers, hey, I've got this kid in my classroom and I think they might, you know, they could use someone to check in with them. Um, those kids don't have an extra set of eyes on them really right now. I think, I mean, the teachers, you know, are, are virtually connected with them, but oftentimes, I don't know about all of you, but I don't think my teenager ever turns his camera on when he's, when he's in class. Um, so that extra set of eyes isn't there. And, 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 and what, what we've found is that the school counselors are still really eager to, um, to connect with kids, to connect with parents, to help be a support for, you know, what's happening. Um, and they've done some work, depending on the school district, they've, they've been, you know, doing a pretty good job at getting additional resources for this time, really being able to connect with kids in a different way, um, provide resources in a different way. Uh, so I would encourage uh, parents to check in with your school, check in with the reason, uh, different schools have different names, but school counselor, resource counselor, guidance counselor. Um, there tend to be some really great resources there. I think in, in our communities, you know, right now with social distancing and, and, and mask wearing, it's, it's harder to, you know, connect with the neighborhood kids and the neighborhood parents. Um, but I think that it's still really important to, you know, maybe, maybe you have a neighborhood Facebook group and you can, you know, kind of put something out there and check in and see how, how folks are doing or, um, you know, go go knock on a door and step back with your mask on and just let your neighbors know, hey, I was thinking about you, just wanted to come check in, how are things going? You can have, you know, driveway conversations. And I think it's about getting creative. It's about understanding that human connection and social connection is still so incredibly important. And so how do we get creative, still make sure our neighbors and our neighbor's kids know that we're thinking about them, um, and connect with them in a way that continues to keep us all safe. So those are my, those are my two cents. I will completely agree with the school counselor piece, just having been in the schools and seeing what amazing work that they do. Um, but I would also add, you know, both closer to home and professional help. I, I'm a huge fan. Like every time we come back to, you know, the option, if you're questioning whether counseling or, or working with, with somebody in mental health is beneficial, just do it. <laughs> like worst case, you know, you wasted an hour or two of your life and um, best case that you, you find a place to really let things out. And particularly with teens, I think that's really important. Um, but I think a difficulty with teens and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to assume that I'm kind of speaking to the choir here if you're here. Um, but, you know, teens are, are tricky because they're in that place where they're supposed to be separating and they need to kind of get some distance from families and they might be a little less ready to um, share some of the information that they want to right now with, with their parents. Um, doesn't mean don't try, um, just be very careful to try not to have any reactions. <laughs> just let them bring it out and, and uh-huh, <laughs> like thank you for sharing that with me. Um, and then you can, you know, call the helpline and be like, they said this, what do I do? Um, or a friend or whoever you need to talk to. Um, but also, you know, who is the, the person in your family system that is that safe person? So it could be, you know, an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or a neighbor or, you know, who is that person that you could say like, hey, they trust you. They know that unless it's, you know, really um, dire that you can keep this between you if, if necessary, um, would you just call and check in and have a conversation, have a Zoom meeting, have a, you know, chat, you know, text, whatever. Um, just check in periodically and, and have a couple people just, how are you really doing? Not the, I'm fine, but really, how are you? Like ask it a few times until they're like, well, here it is. Um, and, and really, you know, all of us, especially teens could use more of that. Um, I'll just add a little bit to you in terms of um, when it comes to teens, they're, they are tricky. <laughs> they're amazing and wonderful. 
<laughs> and and challenging. Um, but you know, part of just their that's part of their developmental level too. That's just where they are developmentally. Um, they have a real need to be competent. And so um anytime we can um just even just to sit in the space, um, they're not always looking at as at us adults <laughs> at the same way now um, to guide them like they did when they were littler. Um, but just even just being in the same space and just offering like, hey, this is this is strange. This is really strange and rough. And I can't imagine what it's like for you. Um, but I'm here. I, you know, I don't even have all the answers. So really anytime we can come uh, to a place of just validating um, and kind of leaving things open-ended and, and you're not gonna get that same reciprocal um, you know, when they're little, you know, you can give them a hug and they give you a hug back and that feels good. You, you're not getting that right now. <laughs> that's normal. Doesn't mean that it's gonna be that way forever. But right here, right now, um, they just need to know that that you um, that you see them, and that you also understand that it's hard, and they may not be ready to talk about it, but that you're here and open to when they are ready, and and just know that um, it will get better. They will age up, <laughs> so you just gotta dig in. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's move on to another question. Um, as a grandmother watching families not familiar with discussing vulnerability, how do we say it's not appropriate to yell at each other or threaten others or promote anger? There are ways to take the first step. Are there ways to take the first step to change a the way of dealing with painful issues. And someone else mentioned um, that anger is an emotion that they're feeling um, much more now and just are curious about, you know, how do we cope with that anger towards maybe people who are, don't appear to be taking precautions during the pandemic, that sort of thing. Uh, well, I'll answer some of that. Um, anger, Anger is a really easy, I mean, it's really easy emotion for us to tap into. It's socially acceptable. I mean, let's be honest, it's, um, we're more, um, you know, we're okay with somebody getting angry, but man, somebody's crying and upset, woo, you know, that's, that's harder to deal with. Um, but that anger is often really just that, that surface emotion and, and underneath it is often um, maybe pain, fear, um, a lot of distress. And so I guess what I always come back to is just validating, man, really upset. I can hear you. <laughs> I, what happened? You know, instead of, yeah, we talk about this in, in when we're um, looking through a trauma-informed lens, right? Instead of, you know, what's wrong with you? It's what happened? What happened? Where is this coming from? It seems like you're in a lot of pain. Um, where, what can what can I do to help? I'm here to listen. I don't I don't have to solve the problem, but I'm here to listen. Um, sometimes just cutting right to it, um, calling out that emotion, and and being curious. Uh, sometimes that is enough to just kind of crack that crack that tough exterior, and and then pave the way for maybe a really rich conversation. And you don't have to have the answers. And I, I, think, um, I think Angie said this earlier, you know, sometimes we maybe hold back from those more difficult conversations or those vulnerable, you know, going to a place that's vulnerable because what do I do if they say X, Y, or Z? You don't have to know. And and if you kind of put yourself in those other shoes, you know, when, when you're in a place where you're feeling really vulnerable or really upset or hurt, you're not necessarily looking for an answer either. You just want a place to put it. You want a safe place to hand it off in a way. And that's all we, we have to do for each other ultimately is just provide that space. Just say, I see you, I can see you're hurting and what happened. And I, I really want to know, and I may not have the answers, but I want to listen. I think specific, 
speaking specifically to um, the one point that you brought up of witnessing um, aggressive behavior, yelling, you know, depending on this could be a spectrum of, of things happening. Um, but on the one end of the spectrum, you know, I, I, I think as we've talked about throughout this presentation, people are struggling right now. Uh, parents are struggling right now. All of our systems are upended. Um, and I think a really beneficial thing that we can all do right now is just practicing as much generosity as possible. And that could be as simple as, you know, if, it, if it's somebody who's in your neighborhood, you know where they live, you know, dropping a card and saying, you know, I, I saw you out with your kids, it must be tough right now. You know, do you need anything? Do you want to have tea across the street or, you know, whatever. Um, and that might be one of those situations and all of these things that we're talking about of so many people needing help right now, that person might need help. Um, and it also might be, you know, you can also look at other supports too, if you're worried about the safety of the kids. Um, you know, again, both Angie and myself work for, for the counties. Um, we can be contact points to, to direct people to appropriate things if you're concerned for the safety of children. Yeah, such good, such good information. I just want to underscore um, what Crystal brought up that that sense of approaching uh, someone with curiosity rather than approaching them to tell them that they're doing something wrong or um, that you don't like the way they're doing something it can make all the difference. I think to, to say to someone, um, you know, I, I've noticed that you're, that you seem extra angry lately. And I'm, I'm curious to know how you're doing. And, and it seems out of character for you. And I'm just worried about you and wondering if you're okay. Um, that's a really different feeling and, and will elicit really different responses than you shouldn't be doing this this way, right? Like, I mean, we've all experienced that. I'm sure as parents, we've all sort of gone down one road or the other at <laughs> different times. Um, so so I, I just, I think that's so important. I think it, kind of grounding yourself in, you know, what is, what is the outcome that you're looking for, right? The outcome you're looking for is ideally, hopefully, to let that person know that you notice and that you care and that you wanna be an ally that you want to be a person that walks alongside them and mm -hmm. um, supports them. And mm -hmm. that alone can change a person's approach to other people, change a person's behavior. Okay, there's a really nice comment that is a compliment for parents from someone. I look on parents of young kids and teens in awe. This is so much for parents and kids to process. Never mind that they are teens. Pat yourselves on the back. I just wanted to share that um, for all the parents that are here tonight. And um, we do have a question from a parent. My 11 year old daughter has been experiencing a high level of anxiety and regression of her former independence as you described. She's expressed fear of something happening to us or herself and doesn't like to be alone. We reached out to her pediatrician for help and were given a list of behavior, behavioral health providers, but these are not virtual providers and we're not com comfortable, confident seeing a provider in person. Um, it's not the safest thing to do right now. Um, do you have any advice for her? For parent? I have two things that come to mind right away. I might think of others. Um, but depending on what type of insurance coverage you have, you can call the insurance provider and they can also provide a list of um, providers that are covered by your insurance. And um, I think most places now, or most providers indicate whether they provide telehealth or in-person appoint appointments. You should be able to ask your insurance provider um, or Apple Health, let them know that you need someone um, who can meet the needs of your 11-year-old, but also provides telehealth appointments. Um, the other resource that I'm aware of that provides uh, pretty up-to-date referral information is Psychology Today. They, they, they keep a, an up-to-date list of providers in your area that focus on different specialties. Um, and last I looked, they also indicated if a provider was providing telehealth appointments. So um, those are two just off the top of my head ideas that I had about how to how to maybe find what you need. Ultimately, you have to be, you and your child both have to be comfortable with the person and the process in order for it to be effective. So I, I, I'm, I'm 
really pleased to hear that you're that you're looking for what works for you and your family and um, it's out there so um, keep looking try those two ideas if I can add one more um, the um, Children's Hospital of Seattle has a referral system um, so if you go and actually I gave that link in um, in that long pile of resources that I sent you. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice comprehensive service and, and um, they have some information of the providers that they're referring to. So that can be helpful as well, particularly with youth. I think I'll just say one thing um, when it comes to, you know, that that age to um, often we have a, a desire to say it's okay there's nothing wrong stop being worried don't don't worry about it. And we're our, you know, our goal is to help our child not feel anxious or worried. And in fact, um, really, they just need kind of that validation that their feeling is real, and it's okay to feel that way. And it makes sense with everything going on. And then reassuring um, that, you know, we're, we're here, we're, we've got it, you know, we've got it under control, you know, we're, we're taking care of you, um, but it's okay to feel how you're feeling. Um, that validation, I'm telling you, <laughs> I talked to a lot of adults who, you know, they just could have had a little bit of validation early on, you know, it could have uh, made a big difference. So validation is powerful. So, you know, don't deny those feelings um, that are being expressed, really um, acknowledge them, and then, and then take the time to kind of explain a little bit about hey yeah we're this it makes sense that you're feeling this way and this is this is why I'm telling you it's okay thank you so I think we have time for one more question and we've got a good one here I'm new to this community moved here in June I do feel very socially isolated and I don't feel as if I have any purpose what can I do to be helpful I would like to volunteer I think this is such a good example of how the ways in which this pandemic have really impacted individuals in our communities. You know, I think um, I think of when I moved into my community, I, a neighbor came over and introduced themselves and brought me a Papa Murphy's pizza, and you know, those things, those little community building personal touches um, are so much harder now, and and I think we're so much more isolated that. It's, it's hard to even think about creative ways, creative ways, you know, to make that happen. So um, I was thinking about, you know, I think it was Betsy that was talking about, you know, dropping a, a card on, on someone's, on someone's front step. I think it could go the other way. You know, if you're, if you've moved in new to a, new to a neighborhood, um, can you write out a few cards and leave them with your neighbors and introduce yourself and just say, Hey, I'm new. And I um, just want to introduce myself. And, and, uh, you know, maybe here's my, you know, would love to get to know you more and leave some contact information if you're comfortable with that. Um, I think that, you know, there are pros and cons with social media for sure, but there definitely are some, are some ways that um, social media is building community. And so it may be worth finding out if your town has, um, has, a, has a community, a Facebook community group and, and use that to reach out and um, to introduce yourself there and, and see if, if there are smaller, uh, maybe more intimate groups where you can get to know a few people and, and um, share your experience. I, it's important to know that you're, you're not alone. Um, there are, there are so many people in, in your circumstance right now who um, are new to communities or who are feeling isolated, um, who are trying to figure out ways to connect with people. And um, I think just as important as sort of solving that problem and thinking uh, of different ways to connect, it's also really important to know that um, it won't always be this way, that we, we do have social connections to look forward to. We are moving in the right direction. We do have um, the, the, the hope of returning to the opportunities to, to connect more with our neighbors in person. And um, so I hope, that, I hope that you're able to, you know, kind of find a way to make those connections in the meantime. But thank you for your question. Betsy or Crystal, did you want to add anything more? Uh, 
Uh, I know I think that that really covered it. I think there's um, yeah, everything it's changed so much the things that would have been easy or common knowledge. Um, now we have to just be more creative around um, create new ways of, of connecting and helping. Well, I just for the social perspective and you know not to like feel the lily, but Snow Isle is great. Like I will just say like the highlight of this has been Snow Isle's trivia nights. Like they're so much fun and they have lots of um, you know crafting and, and things that are to different um, groups. So, you know, I think that's another way that we can again take something creative out of a hard hardship. Thank you, Betsy, for mentioning our other programs. I have one more nice comment and then we'll wrap up for tonight. Um, someone has said, thank you so much for answering directly the questions. Being part of the process of dealing with emotional issues is helpful when future conversations come up. Intergener intergenerational conversations are valuable to building the confidence you mentioned. Past, present, and future are all pieces of the intricate, intricate puzzle going on here. So again, I wanna thank all of you tonight for being here with us. Um, let me do a quick share our thank yous. Right. And we hope that everyone who's been able to join us tonight has gained some valuable information for you and your families. And to learn more about upcoming issues that matter, we ask you to visit www.snowwild.org backslash issues that matter. Our next event coming up is called Recognizing Anxiety and Depression in Kids, and it will take place on Saturday, January 30th at 10 a.m. We have more topics in the works, including surviving online schooling and coping with grief. And finally, we would like to thank the following organizations for their support of issues that matter. Snohomish County Behavioral Health Services, Island County Human Services, Providence Medical Services, and the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation. Thank you everyone and have a good evening.